And that's the last thing church should be is boring. The last thing church should be is lives in boring. So I like it when people interact. Okay, I'm a, huge, I'm a coach. I'm a sports fan. And if you go to a game and something good happens, what do you do? You clap. You cheer. You yell. Okay? Now, I'm as Baptist as they come, so don't go, oh, boy, here he goes. Where's he going? I'm as Baptist as they come, but there's nothing wrong with enjoying church. There's nothing wrong with laughing. There's nothing wrong with clapping if you hear something you like. There's nothing wrong with saying amen if you, in, if you hear something you like. So interact with me. It's going to make me go faster, and we'll get out of here by lunchtime. Okay? <laughs> amen, brother. Thank you. <laughs> One person got it. We're on a roll now. Okay? Um, so it, it just, just enjoy it while we're here today. I, I told you I'm a big sports fan, and I, I, I am so excited about the Arkansas baseball game this afternoon. Y'all realize Arkansas is playing in the College World Series? Okay? And the thought crossed my, crossed my mind this morning as I was going back over what I was going to talk about today. I am so excited about that baseball game. Am I that excited about going to church? And the Lord kind of hit me with the, boy, you need to get your priorities straight. And I'm still excited about that baseball game, but I want to be just excited about sharing the gospel and sharing God. I mean, I love Arkansas. I love the Razorbacks. I just finished, got my master's degree from there. And it's a great thing. Love that school. Anybody LSU fans in here? Well, that's good, because we were going to have to pray for you, but I mean, it's okay. <laughs> we were going to have to, uh-oh, somebody's getting ratted out down here. <laughs> well, at least we know who needs Jesus, okay? And so I'm joking, I'm just joking, I'm just joking, all right? But it's, it, I love sports, and I love that, and I want to take that enthusiasm here today, too. So just enjoy it. If you watch a movie, it brings out emotion. It brings you out, you laugh at a movie, you cry at a movie. You have emotions. Well, let church bring those emotions out into you. Let the Holy Spirit work on you the same way. We can have those same emotions in church. So the big thing I want to say about this, then I'll get into my message, is we have the most sold book in the history of the world. It's historically accurate, as, as historically accurate as any other book that's ever been printed. Other books document what the Bible says happened, and there's a lot of people that try to tell you that's not true, and they're just wrong. There's a lot of books that document the history of the Bible just as it says. That's something we should be excited about. That's something that we should be happy about, and that's something we should be willing to grow and to share and to, be, to get the news out. So while we're here today, feel free to laugh. I try to be funny, and sometimes it works, okay? Sometimes it doesn't. But I always tell people when I talk to them that uh, I, I enjoy fake laughs just as much as real laughs, so it's okay. If I'm not funny, you can go ahead and laugh, and I'll still think I am, and that'll work out just fine. But enjoy it. Laugh. Smile. Open yourself up to what God has for you today, because if you're here, you're here for a purpose, and that purpose is God has something for you. Not me. I'm just up here speaking. But I prayed and prayed and prayed that God would give me the words to speak so it could speak to you and to your need. So we're going to speak today about problems. Any of y'all not have problems? Because if you do, I'm fixing to sit down and let you come preach and tell us how to do it. We all have problems. We all face problems. I, the funny thing about Cliff being in the bulletin is I leave tomorrow morning for uh, Ellington, Missouri. I'm going to preach a five-day youth camp uh, at uh, Ellington, Missouri for a church out of Jonesboro. And uh, the funny story is, is they actually called and wanted Cliff to come do it, and he was booked, so they got me instead. So it, that's where the joke came in this morning in the bulletin. Uh, but I'm happy to go do it, and I'm honored to go do it, but please pray for me. If I spoke to students five days in a row, I was coaching, not preaching. So this is a different opportunity for me, and one I'm really excited about, but uh, it's one I'm also very nervous about, too. Um, I don't want to go up there and spend five days, and by day three, them saying, oh, here comes that guy again. I don't want to hear him. I hope the Lord uses me, and that's my prayer. So pray for me as that as we go, uh, go through uh, and work towards uh, our message today. The verse I'm going to use, just one small verse. Well, it's actually not a small verse, but we're going to use one part of a verse. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 20. If you want to turn there, if you don't, that's okay. We're going to talk about it, but 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 20. In this verse of 2 Samuel, it talks about a man named Benaiah. Okay, Benaiah was a man's man. If you've never heard of him, it's not that surprising because he's only mentioned just a handful of times in the Bible. But what he, when he was mentioned, it was mentioned with many unbelievable acts, 
many acts of strength. Like I said, he was a man's man. He was a valiant warrior. Uh, he was a strong competitor. Whatever he did, he did to his fullest ability. Benaiah was a guy you'd want on your side. He's a guy you'd want on your team. Now, some of the accomplishments of Benaiah we're going to look at just quickly, and I'm going to go down the list. The first thing is he was in charge of David's guard. Um, King David in the Old Testament had what we would know today as a secret service. He had a king's guard. And when you look at the Old Testament history of how many people tried to kill David, how many people wanted him dead, you had Saul, you had his own son at one time was trying to kill him. There was many people that wanted David dead. He needed his own personal bodyguards. And Benaiah was the head of the bodyguards of the King David. So he was a, uh, one of the highest positions you could have militarily in uh, King David's kingdom. So it was a very important position. He was also the commander of David's mercenary forces. Now what that meant was he was not a commander of the Hebrew army, the army of the Hebrews, of King David's actual army, but he was the commander of the foreign armies that King David had under his control as well. So again, he was right there next to the top spot. He was somebody that King David trusted, who he trusted his life to, and gave command over military, over the mercenary uh, uh, forces. Next thing he did was he killed two Moabite heroes. Okay, now the thing I want you to see in this is if you look at this verse in verse 20, it says, Benaiah was a son of, and I'm, guys, I'm not a biblical person, and I'm not even going to try to say that guy's name. Okay, but it starts with a J O, so I'm going to call him Joe. Okay, um, and just, just deal with me. I don't mean any disrespect, I'm just not going to try to get through that and mess it up, or I'm sorry, it starts with J-E, but I'm still going to call him Joe, okay? Uh, Benaiah was the son of this man. He was the son of a valiant man from Kabzil who had done many deeds. He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. We're going to stop right there, these lion-like heroes. What makes a person lion-like? What's characteristic of a lion-like person? Someone who's strong, who's courageous. What's the lion? He's the king. He's the king of the jungle. So you have these two warriors from this other country who are supposed to be the best. They're supposed to be the most courageous. Um, they were strong. They were brave. And uh, Benaiah goes out and kills both of them. It set him above the other people. Now, at that time, to compare somebody to a lion was one of the highest compliments you could give them at that time. During that time period, if you were compared to a lion, that was about as strong of a compliment as you could have received. So for him to kill two lion-like men was about as good as you could do in battle. It was a very big um, accomplishment for him. Then, if you look later in the verse, we're going to skip a, lit, a little bit, and it says he killed an Egyptian giant. Now, we know that David killed Goliath. And if you look in the book, Goliath was eight or nine feet tall, a huge human being. Well, this Egyptian that Benaiah killed was over seven foot tall. So at that time was still very tall uh, for that time frame and that historical period. The thing about this was this Egyptian giant, this seven foot Egyptian was one of those warriors that had never been defeated. He was one of those that was, he was, he was a, like a lion. He came and fought. He had a spear that was almost as tall as him. Benaiah went and went to fight with him with a stick. He had a staff, and that's all he took. You have a seven-footer versus someone who's probably about five, six, five, eight, with a stick. The seven-footer has a spear. Benaiah goes into battle. He gets into a wrestling match, uses his stick to take the spear away from the giant, takes the spear, kills the giant with his own spear. No way he should be able to do that, but that's how big of a warrior he was. That's how good he was. Another huge accomplishment. He used the man's own spear to kill him. Now, in 1 Kings, we also see that Benaiah secured Solomon as a new king, making sure David's wishes were met. When David knew he was about to die, he said that he wanted Solomon, his son, to be the next king. Well, he had other sons. He had stepsons that decided they should be king, and it didn't go as well as what, as smooth as what David wished. Benaiah comes in takes his mercenary forces and actually escorts Solomon into the kingdom and says, here's the new king, and makes sure that he gets his spot on the throne. So he ensured that David's wishes were met by making Solomon the king. After that, 
anyone who came against Solomon, who said they were against Solomon, uh, Benaiah went out and personally killed. So if you said anything against the king that David wanted to be king, Benaiah took care of you and he killed you. He was a, he was a great warrior. After this happened, Solomon named him the general and commander of the Hebrew army. So those armies in, under David's reign that he wasn't quite able to command, he was now the head of the Hebrew army, the highest military position in the kingdom. He had made it to that point. Now, looking at all these stories, okay, I like sports, but I also like entertainment, television, movies. You take these stories out of Benai's life, and doesn't it sound like you could make a movie out of that that would be pretty entertaining? It sounds like stories that you could see on the screen and would be entertaining, and to be able to watch those would be something that would be really entertaining, something you would like to see, something you would want to see. I, I enjoy movies. Some of my favorite movies are the movies that depict the wars, and especially like World War II time. I'm an old history teacher. I wasn't very good at it, but that's what I did, and I really like history. And so the history movies, I love watching those. And, you know, there's, there, it, it goes beyond generation because I like the ones now, and I know a lot of you guys, if I mentioned John Wayne, would say, well, yeah, those were pretty good movies back then too. And so this is something that these battles could make a huge movie and would be really entertaining. And that's why I want to make the point, what I said earlier, is we talk about how church is boring. How can you be bored? if you dig into the stories that are in this Bible. If we read these stories and we don't get entertained on by them, that's on us, not on God, because he's providing us with reasons we should follow him and should be entertained by him. So I've left out the best story. I haven't even told you the best one yet. This is my favorite one, and it's mentioned one time here in verse 20. Uh, it says, I'm going to go back and read, it says, He had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. He had also gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. I read, I'm like, wait a minute. Hit the brakes right there. He went down, killed a lion in a pit on a snowy day. Okay? Now, first thing, thinking geographically, okay? When I think of a lion... I think of either a jungle or some type of desert site. Well, think of Israel. Think of Middle East. What's the first thing you think of geographically? I think of sand, okay, the desert. And he killed him on a snowy day. That just, that, wait a minute. That just doesn't make sense. How does that happen? Well, in that time, it, and even today, it's not necessarily unusual in the mountains for snow to fall. So it, it kind of makes sense, but that's something that ought to catch our attention. And then you look at it, he killed him in a pit. And that's, what's a dude chasing a lion down into a pit for? Why? It's because he felt that's what he needed to do, and we're going to talk about this a little bit. He killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. Now, that's got to catch our attention. The Bible's full of little sentences. I read this sentence, and I'm like, all right. The guy who wrote 2 Samuel, why aren't there more details in just that one sentence? Why didn't you give us more? But we can add details and be pretty accurate. We can do this on our own. So let's look at it. Let's look at this and let's just see how this happened. Now, I mentioned we all have problems. We all have issues that come up in our life. How we deal with those issues kind of define how we are as a person, how our relationship with God is, how things work, how we deal with our problems. And Benaiah had a problem that day. He's walking through uh, his area, he wherever he's been assigned to be that day, and he sees a lion. Okay? Now, let's stop right there. If I'm walking where I'm going and I see a lion, I'm gone. Okay? Whatever I'm supposed to be doing, that's over with. Done. I'm out. I'm running the other way, and I'm praying that it doesn't run because I know I can't run that fast. I can't run out of sight in a day. So I'm out. I'm gone. But now I sees this line and just stops and looks at it. The man might have been a little bit crazy. He might have had a few mental issues. But he was full of faith in God. He was full of faith in God. So when you see that problem you have, what do you do from it? A lot of times we might run from our problems. We might try to stay away from them. 
but you have to sit there and stare at your problem. The Nile had that problem and it was the lion. How did, you, how did he defeat that lion? How did he defeat his problem? Well, he had to follow a few steps. And we're going to go through those pretty quickly here this morning as we go through this. Now, just, just think about this, all right? I, I told y'all we've got to have a little bit of fun this morning. So I want y'all to, we're going to imagine some stuff, okay? See this in your head, okay? See Benaiah walking through wherever he's walking. It's snowy, okay? He's probably got his sandals on and needs his snow boots, okay? It's a snowy morning. He's walking around, sees this line, and he just stops, and he stares at the line. And for some reason, even if he is scared of this line, he's not showing it. He's staring it down, okay? So he's frozen. He's looking at the line. Now put yourself in the line shoes. This line's walking around, and he sees a human. What's the first thing humans do when the line, when he, the line sees them? They're gone. So he sees this guy, he sees Benai, and the lion stops and look at Benai, and Benai is stopping and look at the lion, and the lion's got to be thinking, what's wrong with this cat? Okay, what's wrong with him? Why hasn't he ran? Why hasn't he gone? And he's standing there, and they stare at each other, and Benai is just waiting. He's not flinching. Can you imagine standing there strong, looking a lion at the eye, maybe 10 or 15 yards apart? I, I can't. But that's what he did. The lion looks at Benai and says, this isn't normal. This isn't how it normally works. So I got to get this guy to go. So what's the lion going to do? He's gonna, the baby's got it. He's going to growl at him. Okay? So the lion looks at Benai and goes, Rawr. Y'all ever heard a lion roar? Been to the zoo one time. And we were on the back. I don't remember what city it was in. We were on the back side of the zoo. And you could hear this noise. And I couldn't make out what it was. But it was so loud, we ended up getting closer to it. And this one guy who thought he had the courage of Benai, but really he was behind a fence, was taunting the lion in the lion's cage. And it was making the lion really mad. And he was running around, scratching the ground, hitting trees, and would just roar. And when we got close enough to it, it would roar so loud that literally your chest would shake, like it would with bass music. If you've been around bass music, your chest would vibrate. The lion's roar was so loud, my chest was shaking. I was like, my goodness. That lion roared at Benai, and he just stood there. Now, this lion really had to be messed up then. That always works. So what did he do? He dug a little bit deeper. He found his granddad roar, and he roar and let it have it. And Benai just stood there. So now the lion's really confused, okay? You got to see this. See it with me. The lion's really confused, and he stands there, so he kind of bows his big chest up, and he turns and faces Benai, and Benai's not going anywhere. He sees an opportunity. He sees a problem, and he's going to defeat that problem. And so Benai just looks at that lion and just flinches like he's going to go at it, and the lion takes off running. The lion takes off running. Can you imagine that? We're talking about a lion, the king of the jungle, and one man stares him down and flinches at him, and the lion takes off running. How amazing is that? How awesome is that? Your first step to defeating your problem is that we need to chase what we feel like is chasing us. That lion typically would chase the human. When we have our problems, a lot of times we feel like everywhere we turn, everywhere we go, every move we make, that problem's right there with us. We can't escape it. And it might be because we're running from it instead of running right towards it and going at that problem and attacking it. It's not an easy thing to do. You have to believe. You have to have faith. You have to know you have trust God. You, you have to trust God to take care of you. But if you ever feel like you can't escape the problem that you have, then you have to know that you can't defeat what you don't confront. Think about that in any aspect of life, not just problems, in any aspect. If you don't confront an issue, you can't defeat it. You'll never defeat it running from it. It will always be there. Okay? So you have to confront if you want to defeat. Benaiah started chasing the lion when the lion was supposed to be chasing him. So we go back to the story now. Okay? Chase your problems. Attack your problems. Step two. Well, let's get to step two here in a second. Look at this situation. In most of our lives, if we were ever in a position that we stared down a line, 
and the lion took off running. What were we doing? Well, we're done then, right? We normally would have ran, but we actually stayed. We chased it down. So here's, here's what you do. You go back to work the next day, and you're like, hey, y'all listen to what I did this weekend. I went out. I saw a lion. It growled at me. I stared at it. It growled again. I kept staring at it. And then I just went, boo, and that lion took off running. We're happy. That's something to go home and brag about, isn't it? That's something you go tell your coworkers. I scared a lion and made it run. The problem is, is the next time you're in that area, who's there? The lion's still there. Are you going to get him twice? I don't know if I'd be willing to take that bet or that gamble. Okay? So here's what you got to do in step two. You have, or step one, you have to attack. You have to chase. You have to go after what your problem is. Step two is you have to be willing to kill what's trying to kill you. Those problems will drag you down to the point of even in some situations, well, in the last week and a half, we've had two uh, celebrities commit suicide. Why? We don't know. We don't know what's in their heads. We don't know what's in their hearts. But I'm telling you, they had a problem that was bothering them so much that it drugged them down and it killed them. It killed them. In order to attack these problems, you have to be willing to kill what's trying to kill you. You have to do that. So what did Benai do? He starts chasing the lion. He flinched. The lion takes off running. He goes after it. Most of us would have said, there goes that lion. I'm not dealing with it. But he knew next time he came through that area, that lion would still be there. So he goes, and he starts chasing it. And as he's running, the lion's trying to get away. The lion doesn't know what to think, and it runs, and it runs, and Benai's right on it running through the snow. Remember, it's snowing, and he's still chasing this lion, and the lion maybe trips over a root of a tree and stumbles, and when he stumbles, he falls down into this pit, okay? Freeze it right there, most of us. If that happened to us, we'd be going back to work saying, guess what I did this weekend? I chased the lion. I stared it down. It took off running. I chased it. I chased it so much it fell in a pit. I won. I got that victory. But that lion is still there. The lion's still there. We haven't finished the job. That problem for right now is resolved. But the problem's still there. We have to be willing to kill what's been trying to kill us. So what does Benai do? He gets to the pit. He looks down in it. And sure enough, there's the lion. Now, at this point, even a guy like Benai has got to be thinking, you've got to be kidding me. How does this lion fall down in this pit? And what am I supposed to do with it now? But I just see him without hesitation. He jumps down in it. How crazy is that? How crazy is that? He jumps into a pit. It's bad enough to try to fight a lion in an open space. But y'all have all heard what happens when you corner something that's aggressive. It becomes that much more aggressive. He jumps into this pit and begins to fight. You know what weapons he had? According to the Bible and every other historical evidence of this, nothing. He had nothing. And he jumps into a pit to fight a lion. He jumps down in there. You can imagine the fight. The lion's going to protect itself. He's trying to protect itself. He's jumping on the lion. He's punching the lion. The lion's pawing him, biting him. They go back and forth. Commotion, commotion. If you're outside of that pit and you were looking in, all you would hear was roars and screams. Think about that. And then all of a sudden it stops. There's no more noise. There's nothing. And you're sitting back watching. You can't see in the pit. And out of nowhere, you see a hand reach up over the pit. It's probably covered in blood. It's probably cut up. And then you see the second hand reach up. And you see a man start pulling himself out. And you're wondering, how in the world did this guy get out of that pit with that line? He's probably cut to pieces. He's probably injured way more than what we can even imagine. But the lion's in the bottom of the pit dead. He was willing to kill what was trying to kill him. And he survived. Now that's when you go back to work the next day. And you walk up and say, hey, I'll guess what I did this weekend. And they see you cut, stitched up, bruised. And they're like, man, what happened to you? And you say, you should see the other lion. Um, that's where we would see it in our lives. That's where you would go back and tell that story. But that's not the whole part of it. That's not it. What we have to do is we have to see how we must attack those problems. We must be willing to kill them. 
it's easy for us to run, to hide, to deflect away from a problem and just hope it disappears, pray it disappears. You know, that's what God tells us to do, pray. He's going to deliver us. And that's the truth. But I don't believe that God wants us to pray and just sit and wait on a miracle. God wants us to go and do the work to follow his commands, and he's going to bless us through. The thing is, is, is if, if, if he intended us to just pray and wait on a miracle, he wouldn't have given us the tools that he's given us. Okay? I heard someone last week. We came back from FCA camp last week. Uh, great time. Over 100 kids gave their heart to Christ during that week. It was just an unbelievable time. And I heard one of our speakers say that the Bible, I've always heard this as a coach, uh, the Bible is a playbook. I've always heard that. It tells you what to do, how to do in your life. And so if you're an athlete, you know, if you play on a sport, you have a playbook that tells you what you're supposed to do. But this speaker said something, and it really stuck with me. He said, the Bible's not a playbook, it's a playmaker. And I was like, boy, isn't that the truth? You know what? Because it's the Bible, yeah, it tells us what to do. But if we do what the Bible says, it actually does things for us. It makes the plays. It does what we don't have to do it. We can rely on God because God's given us the tools to go and attack our problems and attack our, or our, our uh, problems and our issues. Now, like as I said, God's given us the power and the tools to defeat the big things in our life. Now, here's the thing is we don't just need to win the victory. We need to celebrate, celebrate the fact that God has delivered us from our problems. How does that happen? We just talked about how if that happened to you, you'd go back and tell all your friends at work, look what happened to me, and you'd be beat up. Well, I'm sure Benai did something similar to that. He had to go back to his, to, his, to his ranks, to his military soldiers, to his guard post. He had to go back, and people had to see him and wonder what in the world happened. And he said, oh, I just saw a lion, and it fell into a pit, and I jumped in and killed it. It was a pretty cool day. Uh, that, that had to be his story. But don't you think he came back telling how he did something that everyone in the world would see as impossible because God gave him the power to do it. You have to celebrate those victories. Okay? Step three, you have to embarrass what's been trying to embarrass you. Our problems can be embarrassing. I have a problem right now today that I'm not going to stand here and tell you what it is because I don't want you to know. It's embarrassing. Could it be worse? Absolutely. I don't want y'all going on thinking, boy, that guy's got something bad wrong with his life. That's not what I'm saying, but I have an issue that I don't want you to know about because it can be embarrassing. I deal with it. I fight it. I try to get things right, and I do get things right, and the Lord helps me and helps me, but that doesn't mean I want to come up here and proclaim it to you. But we have to be willing to embarrass what embarrasses us. When we defeat that giant, when we defeat that line in our lives. When we stop those problems and we get things done, we have to be willing to go out and share exactly what's happened and tell how God helped us win that victory and how God helped us uh, through our situations and our problems. Okay, so we have to do that. Now, <clears throat> the third step, again, like I said, embarrass what's been trying to embarrass you. God's given us the power and the tools to beat the big stuff in our life. We have to celebrate that victory, like I said, now, what we have to understand, and I'm closing up here, what we have to understand is what's been defeating us or what's been defeating you in your life may simply just be because you're running from the problem instead of running towards it. It's that simple. The problems you have in your life might simply be there just because you're running, or running away from it rather than running towards it. Attack those problems. You have the tools. You have God on your side. You have the creator of all things on your side. Benaiah knew he could defeat that line because he had God on his side and God created that line. We were created for a purpose. And God's going to give us those tools to do that. <coughs> Attack your problems. Run towards them with the tools God's giving you and then kill your problems with God's help and then tell the world how God helped you secure that victory in your life. What problems are holding you down this morning? We all have them. We all have them. What problems are holding you down? Have you given that problem to God? Or are you still trying to fight that battle on yourself or on your own? Are you trying to do things your own way or are you trying to do things God's way? Are you running from that problem or are you attacking that problem full speed ahead? 
Are you using the tools that God has given you? Bigger question even yet is do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? All this stuff I've said this morning won't make a sense at all if you don't know that Jesus is in your heart this morning and you have that personal relationship with him. Remember, we can't fight our problems with our own power. We can't do that. We have to fight with the power of the creator of the universe. And I encourage you today, if you don't know him, know him today. I'll be up front. You can come talk to me, and we will introduce you to him and let you share in, what, in the eternal life he has for you and the life here on this earth he has for you. If you have a problem today, maybe you haven't given it to God, and you just want to come down to this altar and say, hey, I've been fighting this myself. I've been running away from it. I've been deflecting it. I've been staying away from it. Today, God, it's yours. Help me attack that problem. God, that's something between you and God. And you just might want to come front for it publicly and not say what your problem is, but give it to God and let him have it. And then watch, do what he says and watch him work towards you or work you towards solving that problem. Anything you have, anything you need, that's what this time is for is to share it with God. So as we have a verse of invitation.